Thanks very much for inviting me today. I'd like to start off by just pointing out that human general intelligence, according to a large literature in economics, matters very little for um, individual productivity. There's a standard result in labor economics. I could mm, point to a couple of dozen papers that say something like this, which is that a, um, a one, one IQ point increase um, only is associated with about maybe a 1% higher wages for an individual person. So um, there are, by definition, 15 IQ points in one standard deviation within a normal population. So one IQ point is a 15th of a standard deviation. Um, that is, this result, as we'll see later, is, seems to be true both within rich countries and within poor countries, because IQ tests have been given in both kinds of places. So um, to economists, um, we often think that in, in competitive markets, you kind of earn your keep. So if one IQ point is only raising your wages by 1%, then um, one IQ point doesn't seem to be worth very much. It doesn't seem to produce that much more. So that, I think of this as a cautionary tale for um, advocates of uh, increasing some kind of uh, machine intelligence, because if, if uh, human general intelligence matters very little, then perhaps um, artificial general intelligence will matter very little as well. So, but um, it's important to try to save these hypotheses. A lot of, a lot of us, myself included, want to think, sorry about that, a lot of us want to think that intelligence pays off a lot. I think there are some reasons to think it does. So how would I go about defending this idea that intelligence matters more for human groups than it does for individuals? One possibility is that there might be a C factor, a collective intelligence factor that's not quite the same as the G factor, that is uh, IQ. Um, so the C factor might be out there, and perhaps there's something, perhaps group performance is driven by different factors than individual performance. And maybe if we can find some measure of this C factor, this C factor will turn out to have really big payoffs in a way that the G factor, normal psychometric intelligence, does not. Another possibility is that there are some spillovers to G, um, to this general intelligence factor uh, that psychologists have documented so often. So perhaps your IQ influences outcomes of those around you. Perhaps your neighbors are sort of poaching your IQ. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about the C factor. Um, this is the kind of thing that was um, just something people would talk about as a, sort of a hypothetical. And uh, now there's a provocative new article that it was in Science last year um, by Wooly Chabris and a series of co-authors. Uh, Chabris, um, best known in uh, the popular press for his uh, very interesting book, The Invisible Gorilla. And uh, he's done a lot of interesting psychometric work. So what, he, what uh, his, the, this group of co-authors did is they gave a variety of psychometric tests to hundreds of students. And then they broke them up into groups of two or three. These psychometric tests were, were individual IQ tests, individual personality tests. And then they asked them some stuff about social, their own personal social skills, some basic tests of individual social skills. And then also they asked them, um, after the experiment was run, they asked them a bunch of questions about their group. How did you think your group worked? I'll talk about those questions later. And then they asked them to perform a bunch of tasks as a group. So like play checkers as a group. So the three of you are playing checkers against the three of them. Or um, in one case, they actually had them solve one part of a typical IQ test, a matrix reasoning test, um, the visual pattern finding portion of an IQ test. Um, they had the group of two or three play the, solve it together. So, and then they had them, then they just did a typical psychometric result. Um, they just searched for the first principal component across these different task performances. And then they said, well, now we've got this first principal component, this fancy weighted average of their performance on these different group tasks. And let's see which of these things up here correlated with their performance on this. So as so much of, of uh, social science research, it all comes down to some kind of Pearson correlation. So, um, so what these folks found was that this C factor really exists. And it was a nice, a, a very nice test of an inf what was heretofore an informal loose idea. So standing alone, perhaps you might think this isn't too surprising. Yeah, maybe groups that are good at playing checkers together are good at solving other kinds of problems together. Um, and maybe groups that are bad at playing checkers together are just bad at other things. Uh, so, by itself, it might not be surprising. Um, but the fact that it was a moderately strong correlation is, is noteworthy. But perhaps what's more interesting to us is which of these other psychometric and social measures the C factor correlated with. 
So here's a, a loose rank order. I'm summing up a, a, some very subtle um, results from the paper, but I think this is a fair way of summing up what, what they found. Um, the number one, uh, the strongest correlate of uh, how the team performed was uh, the equality in the number of times people speak. Basically, if there's a lot of turn taking in speaking and there's not just one or two people dominating the conversation, that was a good predictor of good overall group performance, of a high, high level of C. Second um, was a face reading, how, how individuals in the group on average performed on this face reading test. It's a conventional um, psychometric test. It's, uh, this is actually a very good way of describing it, which is reading the mind and the eyes. So I just show you a bunch of pictures of people's, this part of people's faces and ask you to describe what emotion they're expressing. Um, groups where on average people did well on that did better on playing checkers together. It's perhaps a little surprising. Um, I, I think of both of these as being ways of how do you draw out the knowledge from each individual into the common pool, right? Economists like to think of price mechanisms, incentive mechanisms as ways of, of doing this. Those often work quite well. There's great literature on mechanism design for that. Um, now with the C factor, we can see a little bit of how individuals in small groups find ways to solve this problem. And then the third one, which actually did correlate, uh, was the average IQ, or even better, the group IQ. The, excuse me, the maximum IQ in the group was a, a reasonably good predictor of how the group as a whole did. Um, interestingly, they didn't actually check for one of my favorite ideas, which is a weakest link theory. They didn't check to see whether the lowest IQ in the group was a big driver. Uh, across meta-studies in the uh, management literature of team performance, where they've, there's a big literature on, on the links between uh, group IQ and team performance. Um, there's some evidence that group maximum matters in some kinds of tasks and that the average matters in others and that the minimum matters in others. So I, I think t this is like a natural one for future work. My guess is this paper, because they use such a, they created a new methodology um, that is closely related to a, to a um, both an intuitive idea and to a rich literature in psychometrics. Uh, my guess is this is going to be a thousand citation paper uh, quite soon. So it just, it, it's, a, it's a machine for creating new papers. So here's another interesting fact though, I think. What doesn't the C factor correlate with? Uh, a bunch of things that uh, we're all taught in management programs are supposed to matter. Um, group cohesion, answers to questions like, um, the people in your group, uh, would you all want to hang out? Would you all want to go to a bar together? Would, do you think you get along well enough for that? Um, yes, no, maybe. That didn't seem to correlate with the C factor at all. Group motivation. Um, do you as an individual care about winning? And if on average people in your group care about winning, you might think that that would pay off. Um, that's often used as a, people often say, well, maybe that's what, what IQ tests are measuring. Turns out it's not what IQ tests are measuring as far as we can tell. Here it's not measuring group performance either. Motivation doesn't seem to be, although there, again there's a rich literature in psychology on motivation, doesn't seem to predict group performance any better than it predicts uh, the thing we call IQ. And again, group satisfaction. Do we have a good time? Are we all happy at work? Um, do we have pizza day? Um, so that didn't, that didn't predict uh, productivity either for the group. So, um, so there does seem to be some kind of C factor a collective intelligence that so far with, the, with the, this first papers uh, found some interesting results that, uh, that it correlates with some things that are slightly surprising, does not correlate with some things that we might have expected. And um, this, is, this is cutting edge research. I was very excited to, to see that it, some folks did this. So let me tell you a little about the G factor, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, so this, uh, the G factor is the psychometric term for the first principal component from a wide variety of um, mental ability tests. So I give you, a, for example, the Wechsler IQ test has 13 different subtests. Some are matrix reasoning, some are solving little wood puzzles, um, some are one section to trivia test. Um, one shows you weird pictures uh, or pictures of um, uh, what look like normal life events and you're supposed to explain what's, what's wrong in the picture. So, and then you pull out the first principal component of, again, a fancy weighted average. And um, so Spearman's hypothesis from the early 20th century has been confirmed repeatedly, which is that mental abilities are positively correlated, which means your grandmother is wrong. Life is not fair. 
people who are above average at one thing tend to be above average at other stuff. It's just a general tendency. It's a probabilistic tendency. But on average, people better at math are not worse at verbal. They are better at verbal. So, so your, your grandma's wrong. Sorry. Um, and this means that a small battery of mental tests are often a good proxy for overall mental performance. So intelligence is just more than uh, what IQ tests measure. It has external validity to predicting performance on other, other sort of life events. Um, again, a rich literature on this. Uh, Ian Deary's uh, Intelligence, a very short introduction, is a fantastic survey by a leader in the field if you're looking for a sort of two-hour read that, um, by a major player who's trying to, trying to be uh, both candid and readable. Um, so this is consistent with intelligence being many little things that are bundled together for some reason. Um, in the literature, sometimes this is referred to as the positive manifold theory of intelligence. Uh, perhaps some, there's some social or evolutionary or narrowly economic reason why um, these traits are bundled together, why they correlate. Um, and then Spearman's hypothesis is that it's more like one big thing, that it's something like chip speed. So no matter what your software is, if you've got a really fast chip, it's, your software's probably going to run faster, no matter what the software is. So uh, Spearman used the term mental energy. A lot of people in the early 20th century used that word. I think that was kind of part of the, the, folk, the folk psychology of the day. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into more detail, uh, too much more detail on this, but let me just explain what does IQ predict across individuals at, this, at the individual level uh, to give a sense that it is something like information processing speed. Um, faster reaction to routine stimuli. I have a light that flashes in front of you and the speed with which you touch it, touch it is correlated with your IQ. Um, I, I flash some simple symbol up on this computer screen, um, and, I, and uh, first I flash it up for a second. It's either an L or an F. Then I flash it for a tenth of a second. Then I flash it for a hundredth of a second. Then I flash it for a thousandth of a second, and I see when, you're, when you stop being able to do better than random. Uh, that is associated with IQ, so very simple information processing tasks. Um, one of my favorite facts, um, one of the most surprising facts, one of the things that made me as an economist think there's something to this, is that high IQ predicts lower cerebral glucose metabolism when people are solving problems. If I thought intelligence was about trying hard, about individual motivation, then I would expect this word to be higher. People who have high IQs are people who are trying hard, their families told them to try hard, they come from a culture where you're supposed to try hard or something. Uh, no, they just, they just, they grok. <laughs> um, so, and also nowadays, um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's claim that, there, that this correlation is zero has been emphatically disproven. Um, his, his mismeasure of man, his book, The Mismeasure of Man, is just wrong on that account. Um, uh, now it's uh, completely uncontroversial that, that this is true. So, um, so again, I went through this, uh, the top here, that the, there's a normalization of, uh, a normalization of um, a mean IQ is defined as 100 for the United Kingdom. You have to have some kind of basis across which to compare things. Um, that's just a nominal difference. And uh, standard deviation within the UK is defined as 15 IQ points. There is no genius cutoff for IQ. I, um, looked at, I've tried to read about this many times, and uh, you cannot get psych people to say, if you have an IQ above this level, you're a genius. Although everyone wants to think, oh, well, what's the cutoff for genius IQ? And, oh, I must be right above that cutoff. <laughs> So, um, and also, just as importantly, and this just came up at dinner last night with, uh, with um, a colleague of mine from grad school, um, there is no IQ only cutoff for mental retardation. So um, the DSM-4, the, which will soon be the DSM-5, the standard psych, uh, psychological manual for, um, for psych, psychological practice, um, does not have an IQ only cutoff for mental retardation. You basically have to have an IQ below 55 uh, plus major functional problems for the standard definition of mental retardation. There's a list of about eight items, and you've got two things on the list of these functional problems. Uh, that would be a definition uh, of mental retardation. So there are plenty of people getting along uh, all right in life, um, holding down jobs and uh, taking care of their basic daily needs on their own. Uh, with, with quite low IQs, which is no surprising, not surprising at all when you look at my result from the first, from the labor economics result, which is that, hey, if you go from 100 IQ to a 55 IQ, that should only be lowering your wage about 45%, even if you look at the exponential side, maybe that gets up to 55 or 
uh, there are probably plenty of people in your town who have income 60% higher or 60% lower than you, and you can probably guess who they are on average, but mm, not that. You, you probably make a lot of mistakes. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about how uh, IQ tests are given across countries. This is what matters for my work. Um, I started uh, off trying to figure out uh, whether these psychometric tests um, did a better job predicting national economic outcomes than individual ones. And um, just to give you a sense of where these databases come from, I've used them in some of my work. Um, there are pr large private firms that create big standardization samples for the largest countries. So, um, so it's, it is the modal sample for when they're trying to do a standardization is right around 1,000 1, <laughs> people in a country. Um, sometimes they're genuine um, stratified random samples. Uh, just the kind you'd want for like a good political polling firm. Sometimes they're not quite as good as that, but um, still a, a good distribution across the country. Um, these are estimated. So with about a thousand, you can actually get a good sense of the variance, a good sense of the standard deviation here. And um, psychologists spent a lot of time in the 60s, 70s, and by by the 70s, um, they had really rooted out as many cultural biases as they think they they could. So the literature has, I think, it's safe to say, paused on that issue. Um, so cross-culture comparisons are very, very important and uh, making, things, making sure these things are comparable is valuable, but looks like they've made substantial progress on that. Uh, the databases I use are um, Lynn and Van Hainen created some uh, two different databases and then Lynn and Meisenberg have one in intelligence where they sort of as assemble it and compare <laughs> it to cross-country math and science scores. Uh, there's a critique of the, in particular, the African IQ estimates. There's been some back and forth in the psychometric literature on Lynn and Van Hainen's African estimates and Weikert's and a series of co-authors you can pull up their papers online that just Weikert pulls up most of them. You'll find that at the end of the day, although, although he has very harsh words uh, in his critiques of Lynn, and, Lynn et al.'s databases of African IQ estimates, at the end of the day, um, when he uses his most rigorous sample selection of all, Lynn and Van Hainen's preferred African IQ estimates have a median right around 70, and Weikert's preferred African IQ estimates are 76.5. So he, this is the major critic, the person saying, boy, these estimates are really biased. Linda Van Hainen are really doing a disservice to the profession by blah, 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 and maybe very inflammatory language at times. And then at the end of the day, once they're very tough and they say, well, boy, we're going we're gonna to show that you guys used much too, you used all the bad estimates. But once they go through, they, that's about what they find. So um, again, um, everyone in the literature agrees that there are large environmental influences here that drive this. We'll, I won't get too much of a chance to talk about it. That's not really my goal here today. Um, but um, th I think that gives you a sense of kind of where the literature is. Um, somewhere between 70 and 80 is sort of at the low end, depending on, on who you're talking to. Uh, the, what, the Raven's progressive matrices, the visual pattern finding test, is widely used in cross-country settings. Um, and to give you a sense of what these look like when they're used in a rural country, uh, a study of rural Pakistan published in a good economics journal. Uh, they went to four different provinces in rural Pakistan. Um, they used a male-only sample because those were the folks who were routinely working uh, after childhood. And um, they found a result that's just like the, the rich country results. So one sigma higher, 15 higher IQ points, 13% higher wages. So there seems to be this sort of cross-cultural cross validity, this small effect. Reasonable but small. Okay. So um, what I found in my, in my early work with psychologist Joel Schneider is that this national G, these national IQ estimates, predict much bigger differences in productivity than the individual level IQ estimates do for a person's wages. So IQ seem to matter. Intelligence, this estimate of intelligence, seem to matter much more for nations than for individuals. So I, have a, I spent the next few years thinking of a variety of spillover channels. I started this work in 2003. Things through a variety of spillover channels, and these three here are the ones I'm really not going to spend much time on today. Um, uh, they're, they're a little more inside baseball, I think, for economists. And the first is a, a, a part of this I'll come back to. A routine psychological and now behavioral economics result is that high IQ predicts patients. Normal economic theory predicts that patient groups should be saving more and building up bigger capital stocks, and if you have more machines to work with, you're more productive. Um, another story that I think is, is important for um, sort of the management types is, which I, which I haven't delved into um, 
which has plenty of room for further development, is that high IQ groups can use delicate O-ring technology. A lot of things are like building the space shuttle where one thing goes wrong and the whole thing literally blows up, right? Computer chips, one small mistake in the production process, the whole thing is worthless. Uh, even clothing, there's small errors in clothing manufacture and all of a sudden it goes to a off-price store selling for 10%, 20% of the original price. Just a few, a few threads awry. So much of modern output that we produce, much of the modern output we value um, is easy to break. Software probably breaks for very tiny reasons that, that little, few of us can understand. The whole thing has to hold together. There are a lot of weakest link stories in modern productivity. Um, and uh, Mike uh, Creamer at Harvard has a, a theory of this, which I've, I've developed a bit. And then uh, Kaplan and Miller's paper in Intelligence, which got some media attention last year, shows that uh, within the US, at least high IQ groups are more likely to support pro-market policies, which I like to, the way I like to phrase it is that smarter people are more likely to see the invisible hand. So this slide, I'm uh, shamelessly stealing from the talk I gave a couple of days ago in Manila at the Asian Development Bank. So, um, so here's national average IQ estimates from uh, different countries in the ADB region. And um, on the x-axis, and here's log gross national income per capita on the y-axis. These countries over here are the East Asian countries. There's the People's Republic of China. Right there, I think, is the country that for, for a perp, when I was at the Asian Development Bank, I was refer, required to refer to as Chinese Taipei. <laughs> so I'm very emphatic about that. I don't know why. Maybe somebody here can explain that. <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, some, one of those two. Um, and then some mixture here is Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India. Um, so that, that just shows you that this correlation holds within, within the Asian Development Bank region, which is basically uh, South Asia, East Asia, and a couple of regional off, re, a couple other countries in the region. Um, this simple correlation, I had thousands of regressions I'm not going to report, but this simple correlation shows that uh, one IQ point associated with 3.7% higher productivity, which is about four times bigger than the individual effect. Um, <coughs> So when I see a correlation like that, I wonder, can I have a micro-level story, a micro-structure story that can explain causation? Because regression can't really get me a causation, but it can maybe point me in a direction. Do I have a micro-level theory that ex can explain this? And this is one that I think is, uh, uh, deserves uh, uh, attention, partly because economists have talked about this in so many other contexts. Um, cooperation with strangers seems to be central to building good societies. And um, so having mechanisms to get strangers to cooperate with each other um, when there's no central enforcer, no central enforcer uh, is, is really valuable. So we often refer to this as the prisoner's dilemma. I, I'm guessing most people here are familiar with prisoner's dilemmas. Um, here's a few examples. Um, do the army and the navy launch coups against the government or do they let democracy continue? That's an example of a prisoner's dilemma. So. Um, it would be great for the army if it just took over the country because they'd get to run the country. The navy took over the country, it'd be great because the navy would get to run the country. Like all the, you know, all the admirals would get to have, they'd all get to be billionaires. They'd all get the biggest houses. Personally, for the United States, I am surprised that the Air Force does not run my country. <laughs> right? They are in charge of all the nuclear weapons. This is a big decision made in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s. I forget the exact year. They're in charge of the nuclear weapons. Why don't they run my country? I must really misunderstand something about social order, <laughs> right? There must be something big I'm missing. The people in charge of the, I mean, this is a standard st story in both naive libertarianism and fancy political economy theory, which is that the people with the guns make the rules. So do traders exchange what they are promised or do they send damaged goods? Suppose it's just bilateral trade, you know, um, do, I, do I give you what I said I was going to give you or do I give you the, the, crumb, the thing that's broken? Um, do I cooperate with the police officer who, um, when, my, when my stuff got stolen? Or, and does the police officer refrain from demanding a bribe? So am I nice to the cop and is the cop nice to me? So my, my mom's um, is it nail stylist had something stolen and the cops got it. This is in Orange County, California, Southern California. This uh, person was a first generation immigrant. The, the, the victim of theft, and uh, the police officer spent months saying, um, you need to pay me a cash fine, a, a cash fee so I can return your stolen goods. 
right? This is something in the U.S. like, I'm thinking this is the kind of thing that happens, but this, is, this happens, right? So, why, you know, it's, you really don't want to co cooperate with police officers when you feel like anything you give them is just going to be used against you at some point in the future. So, um, there is, but there is a standard result in um, game theory known as the folk theorem, which is that once you go from these things being one-shot games to being repeated games, you have a possibility where the shadow of the future, the promise of um, big payoffs from cooperation, will, will make, makes it worth it to actually cooperate. So the Army and Navy don't launch coups because they think the other one's not going to launch a coup, and they'd like to, like, fighting a war is kind of expensive, and you know if one of you does it, the other one's going to do it. And um, there are formal, so many formal proofs of the folk. There were, uh, the folk theorem is such a big idea in game theory, nobody's willing to lay claim to it. But it is a core idea that patience opens the door to win-win. In this example, for instance, it's reputation that's a standard story for explaining why traders exchange what they're promised. You know, repeat customers are crucial. So, so reputation solves, re reputation covers the multitude of sins. So it's why I always get bad food in, in, when I'm just in drive through towns, right? It's the reason that chain stores dominated, now dominate the um, traveler food market, right? So mom and pop stores can't make it in a world of where people are just driving through all the time because the mom and pop store has no incentive to actually, mom and pop restaurant has no incentive to actually provide a good product because they have very little repeat business. Whereas McDonald's has much stronger reputation to provide a reasonable product because they're relying on some kind of repeat business. So um, more hope for cooperation, uh, the Coase theorem. So um, Coase's story, so Coase, Nobel Prize winner, a lot of uh, last year, uh, Ostrom and Williamson's work, which won the Nobel, is, uh, are basically real-world applications of the Coase theorem. And Coase, one of Coase's big ideas is that in a world of free, that is free of transaction costs, people can bargain to efficient outcomes, which is almost a trivial point, right? Um, that people don't like leaving food on the, people don't like leaving money on the table. Um, so a classic example is suppose there's a polluter um, polluting in his river and uh, there's a fishery downstream, uh, and that's hurting the, the fisher, the uh, fishery's productivity. Well, how would you tell what's the efficient thing to happen? What's the sort of output maximizing thing to happen? Um, I mean, the stuff being produced by the factory has some value, the fish have some value. What's the, what's the way to solve the problem? Kosa's story is that, well, I'm only going to mention one here, I'm going to mention the most appalling one. Uh, the most appalling possibility. Well, maybe the pollutee, the fishery, can just pay the polluter to stop polluting. So, you know, if, if you don't like it, you should just pay to stop it. You sign a contract and boom. So, and then once you think of it in those terms, you'll think, well, the fishery has to think, how much should I pay? How much is it worth it for me to pay to get a certain amount of pollution reduction? And the, pol and the uh, factory has to think, if I get bribed enough, how much will I cut back on my production? How many profits am I, how much profit am I making for the marginal amount of output? So there's a bargaining process that goes on. And uh, what Coase pointed out is that people can, he used examples of uh, uh, cattle breaking through a barrier and, and trampling the neighbor's field as well. Um, so these themes that uh, in a world free of transaction costs, you could bargain to some kind of efficiency has had a big effect on post-war economics. Um, and a prisoner's dilemma is just sort of one version of, of a world of high transaction costs. I'm making my move, you're making my move. We, there's no way for us to sign an ex-ante contract. There's very high transaction costs in that world. So how can we get to efficiency? How can we get to that the sort of most efficient outcome possible? It might not be a pleasant outcome, but it just might be the most, most efficient thing to pull off. Well, um, an idea that's been... Of, of how people can get to these efficient outcomes lies, bear, lies within Axelrod's classic text, The Evolution of Cooperation, uh, a book that meant a lot more to me after I had read IQ research. Um, so Axelrod is the one who's noted for his talking about how um, World War I, uh, soldiers in the World War I trenches um, were, in a liter were in a prisoner's dilemma with each other. So say uh, French soldiers on one side and German soldiers on the other side. Um, 
Not if, as long as the French didn't fire over, the Germans would tacitly agree not to fire over, right? And because this was a repeated game, you could build um, some cooperation between the French and the German soldiers. So the French and the German soldiers are bargaining in a game against their own generals here, right? Mm -hmm. They have a strong interest in saving their own lives. And what makes it possible is the fact that they're repeating this game with each other. Um, higher ups, according to Axelrod, higher ups, and, the, and uh, I believe he has stories from the uh, Allied side, um, uh, letters from the Allied side saying, we need to find a way to break this up, so what will we do? We'll move troops around up and down the front line, and therefore they won't be facing people that they have built long-term relationships with. So they grokked onto the same idea um, as the chain stores that took over um, interstate restaurants, which is that reputation, being in a relationship long term with, with another person is a way of getting to a, to a better equilibrium. So relationships are a way of getting to trust. So, um, so Axelrod, so Axelrod um, toward the end of his book, he says, uh, here's three things that I think can help create prisoner's dilemma cooperation when people are playing a game with each other many, many times. Um, and my way of summing it up is patience, perceptiveness that there's a potential win-win, and pleasantness. So the, ple the patience is just having that long shadow of the future. It's basically believing in the folk theorem. You know, if we'll try cooperating this time because if we can keep cooperation going, there's a lot of benefits here. It's much better than me just lobbing some weapons over to your side once and hoping that kills you, right? That's putting too much faith in, in uh, military artillery. Um, the perceptiveness of a potential win-win, basically people who can understand the rules of a game and can, I mean, it's amazing. Like, I mean, how many times do you have to play Monopoly before you really figure out all the rules, right? Just even simple games or chess or checkers. Let, and a prisoner's dilemma might be much simpler, but real world political institutions much more nuanced. And then pleasantness, starting off by just being a little more likely to cooperate, right? If you just come into a game, um, to, to quote uh, President Obama, if the other side's bringing a knife to a fight, we're going to bring a gun. If you are coming in with bitterness and recrimination, right? You're just, I, I just want to go at it right off the bat. That's gonna, then it descends into, descends into bitterness and recrimination like um, the uh, tail end of a dissolving marriage, right? You don't want to, you want things to end that way. You don't want things to begin that way. Right? OK. So what I showed is that um, IQ does predict cooperation with strangers. So mine was the first paper to show this. Um, uh, at the time, I, I was not an experimental economist. I was a macroeconomist. I'd run a lot of regressions, did a lot of stuff about GDP and whatnot. But I, was, but I had this idea that from Axelrod, inspired by Axelrod, that smarter groups should be cooperating more. So uh, I didn't have that tools to write to do an experiment. So what did I do? I, I got a, a research assistant to go and collect all the studies she could find on repeated prisoners' dilemmas run at different universities across the US. And um, then I had her collect data on the average SAT scores and ACT scores at all of these universities. And um, I collected data on a bunch of other things about the games, like whether they played with mo for money and how many rounds and a few other things, gender, the players. Um, Surprisingly, nobody had actually given the players an IQ test beforehand in any of these studies, or anything like an IQ test. I looked hard. So um, what I found ultimately was that uh, 100 uh, schools where the ACT, SAT um, score, the college admission score, was 100 points higher, which is a substantial amount, is about, there was associated with 5 to 8% more cooperation. So there I found evidence that smarter groups were more cooperative. They were able to see the win-win. They were able to live in a world where reputation mattered, rather than just saying, maybe I can get away with this just this once. You know? Maybe I can get a bribe out of the guy just this once, and we'll still have a good police force in town. So since then, subsequent work has confirmed my uh, result in a number of ways. Um, Burks, Rustichini, and a number of co-authors had a piece in PNAS where um, they, uh, they got permission to uh, they were actually paid, I believe, um, by a uh, truck driver training school to find, they basically, the truck driver training school wanted to find out why do people drop out and how can we get people to not drop out. And uh, so the, uh, these folks went in, these economists, 
went in and gave a bunch of IQ tests to everybody and a bunch of other psychometric tests and had them play a bunch of different games. And in one particular game, which was like a two-round prisoner's dilemma, they found that IQ, that uh, player's intelligence, was associated with how you behaved in the first round and how you behaved at the end of the game. So the two round. Not, it predicted niceness at the beginning and generosity at the end, weekly speak, uh, strictly speaking. Um, uh, Lewis Putterman at Brown with a couple of co-authors has a new paper where he runs a, a public goods game, which is basically a uh, continuous version of a prisoner's dilemma. So it's not prisoner's dilemma is 1-0, I'm nice to you or I'm mean. This is more like 1-10. to 10. Uh, we can decide how nice. What he found, he did really, he did confirm the pleasantness channel, which I hadn't been able to really confirm before, which is that high IQ players start off really nice on average in a 10 round game. They throw a lot in, they cooperate, they, and ultimately that gets them, that spurs more cooperation among others. If other people are cooperating in the room, you're like, well, it's a repeated game, maybe we can keep this thing going, you know? You know, he seemed kind of nice on the first date. Maybe I'll be nice on the second date, right? Let's see if we can keep this thing going. So Potterman found evidence of that. Um, and, but he also finds that it drops off. So the high IQ people start off high and then drop down lower on it, drop down on average. But still on average, across the course of the game, they're still cooperating more. And then in two unpublished studies, which I, I haven't gotten around to writing this one yet, um, we, we actually ran a real experiment, so I don't just have to use a meta-study. We ran real experiments with my colleague uh, Omar al Badley and a grad student um, on this. And uh, we found, sure enough, that um, smarter pairs were more cooperative and um, that it re really paid off. It was a huge effect. And then Kevin McCabe, who uh, with a number of co-authors have some recent research, which is, is still in published, where they found that um, they ran a McCabe, what's, what I like to call a McCabe-style trust, investment trust game which is a sort of two-round version of a prisoner's dilemma. And there they found intelligence in a simple two-round game. Um, higher, more intelligent players gave more in the first round and were more sensitive in their reciprocity in the second round. So if you send me a lot of money over, I send you a lot of money over. If you send me a little over, I send you a little over. So there's a sensitivity to that reciprocity. And as a result, it meant that if you had two intelligent players playing against each other, you'd get very close to an efficient outcome, which is sort of what we're hoping for, is that somehow intelligence can pay off for groups as a whole. So um, politics, I think, demands, the political institutions that we live in, demand some kind of tacit, repeated prisoner's dilemma style cooperation. I don't just mean this for democracy, although I think it's especially important in democracy. Um, and it appears that high IQ groups are better at this kind of tacit RPD style cooperation. Um, do I step down from power? I just lost this election. Why am I going to step down from power again? So, you know, The Onion had, an, had a great article in 2000, in the year 2000, after uh, the November elections, where it said, you know, um, uh, Generalissimo Clinton declares he will stay in power to save the nation from the prospect of the battle over the Bush, uh, uh, Gore Bush, uh, Florida. Recount. So I think a lot of people would have, cut, would have taken that deal. <laughs> so, um, so the failure of the Coase theorem in politics has always been a puzzle. You can get a lot of economists, you can always start, always start an argument with economists by, by bringing this up. Why does the Coase theorem fail in politics? Uh, Daron Asimoglu, a leading political economy scholar, has a paper called Why Is There No Political Coase Theorem? Um, we see it happen in markets a lot where there's this sort of general urge for efficiency where new institutions arise to kind of push things in the direction of efficiency. In political economy, in the world of politics, it seems like a lot more sluggish. Um, what I'd like to point out is that standard dynamic political economy models, when economists think about why, and political scientists as well, think about how you build institutions and what, how societies, why societies decide to stick with their political institution rather than, say, revolting, rather than, say, seceding, uh, rather than saying withdrawing from political life. Every, these, if it's a dynamic model, somewhere in there, there is a discount factor, usually the letter beta. There's some kind of discount rate. And that discount rate is a key driver of the outcomes. And we always treat it very cavalierly as if it's the same everywhere and at all times. It's not a time-varying phenomenon. Although in macro, in, in the field of finance, it's quite common to use time-varying discount premia 
right? To believe there's some reason why people are more patient sometimes and more impulsive at other times. Um, but the idea that this differs across countries, even though it's fairly decent psychometric literature pointing in that direction, something economists ignore. So every single political economy model, every dynamic political economy model is implicitly a theory where IQ should matter for politics. Um, time consistency is a Nobel Prize winning idea where this should matter a lot. Um, repu basically, stories of reputation. If I care about my reputation a lot, you know, I, let me reverse this. If I care about the future, then I care about my reputation, right? It's the reason, it's the, reason the elderly are grumpy, right? They're just about to check out. They don't care about building a good reputation anymore, right? They can just be who they want to be. So. I'm grumpier than I was when I was half my age, so I think it's, I'm, I'm descending into, you know, not caring about my reputation anymore. <laughs> okay, so here's some uh, cross, just a raw cross-country correlation showing that this uh, exists within again within the ADB region, um, and um, this is a rank order from something known as the Doing Business Index, which is a popular uh, rank order of sort of. Uh, Business efficiency, governmental efficiency created by the World Bank. Uh, it indexes things like how long does it take to start a business, uh, how often do you have to pay bribes to, to tax authorities, things like this, right? Um, and uh, so this is just the raw ranking. Uh, and um, what you find is that in the high IQ countries, um, the uh, doing business rank is much higher. One IQ point is associated with being 3.8. Uh, having a rank that's 3.8 higher, and just the simple regression, it's an R squared of, of 52%. Again, that's China, which is you know, an outlier for its um, uh, IQ level, but not as still, still reasonably high in the rank order of the region. Um, and um, th there are a number of other uh, cross-country indices of good institutions, and uh, at least at the aggregate level, this correlation is going to hold up. But the core thing for me is that this confirms this idea that highly intelligent groups, as theory and basic experimental evidence predicts, uh, more intelligent groups create some things that none of them really get the benefits of as individuals. I, as an individual, you know, if I'm being a team player and you know, showing, read, reading the newspapers and being an informed voter, um, if I, as a, as a good cop, decide not to take a bribe, I don't get a big bonus for that. It sort of, sort of creates, it's, sort of, it's a big, it's a form of a cognitive spillover. It yields things that I personally don't get the benefits from. So um, this, I think, can explain why it shows up very little for wages, but shows up a lot for uh, nations. So um, I, I think that one scenario that's worth thinking of is that um, artificial, and I know this is something that's come up in the, in the literature before. Um, I'd like to apply it here to sort of my results which is that uh, artificial general intelligence is a potential immiserator. And my, my story here kind of gives one channel for which that could happen. So, so, so scenario, AGI boosts rich country productivity. Cross country inequality remains the same. And so you have the same 30 to 50 times difference in productivity across countries. So that's, you know, if, if poor countries still perform at have the same uh, lag that they currently do, then, uh, then that's a big effect. In dollar terms, it would be a massive effect. If frontier countries move to sort of singularity type levels of productivity and, um, and poor countries are far, be far behind that, then uh, we, that, that would be something much greater than the two nations sort of stories we often hear about. Another possibility is even worse, which is that uh, a recurring theme in economic growth research is that there's, uh, the world either is in or is moving toward a Twin Peaks world of widening inequality. Um, this, this is a widely discussed area in the literature. Um, it's usually noted that uh, African countries um, have seem like they have been in a, what's known as a convergence club, where they're sort of converging to a, a separate lower equilibrium. They're not converging at, they're not even sort of staying the same. As the, as the, as the rich nations grow at 2% per capita per year, they might be growing at sort of 1, 1.1% on average over long term and then you wind up with a very big divergence. If they both grew at 2%, there would at least be a constant gap in percentage terms. Um, Africa had an excellent decade in the 2000s, actually. Uh, so Sub-Saharan Africa um, violated a lot of the predictions of moving toward Twin Peaks. So that's been a great decade for Africa. If it continues, then we really don't have to worry about that too much. But 
um, it is worth it is something worth thinking about whether the the new technologies of the future will be inclined to help create this Twin Peaks world. If these are fragile technologies that depend on a lot of social cooperation to hold the system together, then um, then differences in IQ could have big implications here. Um, another possibility, though, the more hopeful possibility, one that I will close with, is that perhaps artificial general intelligence can find a way to substitute for tacit cooperation or to create environments where it is easier for people to tacitly cooperate. To build, so to, as I've thought of it, um, the political implications and the political economy implications of AGI are extremely important. Ed Glazer once co-authored a paper where he noted that the key human, where he claimed, he claimed, that the key human capital externality is not technological but political. He gave some evidence for that. My own work has given some evidence for that as well. Um, if this is true, if the key human capital externality that we care about is not technological, which gets so much of the discussion, but it's actually political, then, um, then this, this means that there should be some serious focus on this possibility that AGI could take the place of or even become a set of good economic institutions. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Please do. <laughs> um, when you talk about artificial general intelligence, we're usually trying to talk about what separates a chimpanzee from a rabbit, uh -huh. what separates a human from a chimp. And it's not quite sure that, I, that IQ is measuring the same sort of dimension that yes. human-chimp differences are. And, you will, and I, I, I haven't done the study, but informally, there appear to me to be very large economic differences between humans and chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, there are indeed. That should be accounted for in the correlations. <laughs> um, can I just let that stand as a comment? I mean, if you have, if you have a particular question, I'm happy to, to discuss that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, am, I am completely new to the field of AGI. All I know is what I know from being uh, three doors down from Robin Hanson. <laughs> so that's, that's probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the altruism in relation to uh, cooperation as distinct from any particular measure of IQ mm -hmm. might be a way of, of comparing the two. Well, th th yeah, that's what I call as pleasantness. Yeah, so starting off uh, altruistically early on when it's really not in your narrow, narrow self-interest, yeah. Um, just a question about like association and cause. I, like, uh, sure. I don't have any argument with your data. It all looks really good. Um, yeah. But you seem to have implied, perhaps, I might be mistaken, that intelligence is causing wealth of a nation uh -huh. more so than the wealth of a nation is causing intelligence. Yes. Whereas, in fact, I'd argue that it probably works both ways as a feedback loop and that wealth probably causes intelligence more than intelligence causes wealth. So if you think about someone in Mozambique that has poor nutrition as a child and no education, it's not really surprising if they've got 75 IQ when they uh -huh. grow up. Uh -huh. Whereas... Uh, we're growing up in peaceful countries with no corruption, yeah. adequate nutrition, good schools. That's going to cause us to be smarter, right? Well, and let's think about how... Okay, go ahead. Also, yeah. I think it will feed back. So I think your point that then, because we're smarter, our economy is going to grow more quickly as well. Uh -huh. So just could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Well, let's think of how you would test that. For, for instance, there is a... For one, there's a vast um, twin in adoption literature that looks at the effects of family environment uh -huh. on adult intelligence. So one might think that a, this is mostly studying people across the normal range of variation in the rich countries. Um, so it's not looking at people who, like children who are kept in closets, for instance, right? Uh, but across the normal range of variation uh, in rich countries, a family environment has negligible adult effect on intelligence. That's probably not exactly what you're testing, but it's, but it's, what, it's what the psych people can bring to the table, the psych and genetics people. Let me tell you what I can bring to the table. Let's think of two regions in the world that um, have had big increases in their income in uh, the 20th century where we've been able to have some of these IQ tests. Well, one is um, um, East Asia. East Asia and some of its offshoots went through a massive economic miracle, right, where, country, where people went from being predominantly agricultural, um, 
living in something that looks a lot like the 16th century to living in the modern world within a few, de few decades. One might expect that IQs there would have been sort of at the sort of Mozambique level or maybe at the India level, maybe at the... Well, have we got data on that though? Yes, we do actually. <laughs> That's why I'm mentioning it. So yes, yeah, so we have, uh, we have IQ scores going back to the 60s yeah. from a few of these East Asian countries. And all of the early examples, all the early data we have are these average IQs in East Asia were above 100 back when the revolution was occurring. Right. Taiwan. I'm allowed to say that here, right? Uh, Taiwan is one of the early samples in the database. And just a few years after the, the people of Taiwan had fled the mainland, somebody ran an IQ test. I haven't actually looked at the study in a long time to see where it was. But, um, and um, I th it was certainly within a decade. And hmm, IQ above 104, 105. So um, another example is, uh, so, so, so it's going back as far as we have data. That seems to be the case. Second. Um, Economists like exogenous shocks. So um, we'll take an exogenous shock even if everything else about the data are bad. So um, look at the, the OPEC countries. After 1973, there was a big OPEC oil price shock where the OPEC folks realized, hey, we can tell the world how much, we, how much, how much the price of oil is going to be. So oil price skyrockets. Um, and you could look at decades later, look at what happened to the average IQs in those countries. And you could say compare OPEC versus non-OPEC countries. Um, that were sort of in the same region. Because there are a lot of Middle Eastern, North African countries that are non-OPEC, have negligible oil, some that have a lot of oil. So uh, regardless of whether you do the difference in differences or the raw time series story, no bump in intelligence. Again, you could tell a story why there's some political thing that the money didn't get to the people or whatever. So how has it affected IQ in uh, OPEC countries then? So the wealth's gone up zero. Yeah, so the wealth's gone up massively. The wealth's gone up massively. Yeah. yeah, GDP per capita, if you look at like the GDP in these countries, like you look at yeah. Saudi's GDP, whoop, right? Yeah. So, and IQ, nothing. Is that like it's wealth evenly distributed in Saudi? Now, that's, a, that's a nice, interesting question, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on Saudi um, stuff, but on things Saudi, but I think it's safe to say that um, the typical Saudi has better nutrition uh, than the typical Moroccan. So, I've only been to Morocco, not to Saudi. I've just seen Saudi on TV, but and, and talked to people who've been there. So, um, so so that's why that. Like I said, economists love a um, natural experiment, even if everything else about the data are crummy. But I think the East Asian story. Um, enough people have been to East Asia to sort of say, well, I can. Yeah, it looks like the wealth's kind of distributed there well enough, and a lot of people get education, and people get food there. So it's not that it's all just hoarded by the top one percent. Um, so um, there is a long-term rise in IQ known as the Flynn effect, which I've devoted, uh, which I'm not talked to about here. But I think simple reverse causality stories are just, uh, the evidence is pointing against. It's not just to say there's no evidence to the evidence is pointing against. There's a couple of follow-ups, people who want to follow up, so just keep the finger. And uh, just for the follow-ups, Jesse, you're the first one. Uh, so just uh, on, on two points of evidence you mentioned, with, with respect to behavioral genetics, I think you gave your own reputation, which is if you're dealing with fixed environments, then, of course, the variants that will be carried in the group will be uh, biologically uh, tracked. But when you're dealing with cross-national comparisons where there's huge environmental differences, mm -hmm. the idea that environment might not be contributing to those, con those differences uh, is it, just totally unsupported by any study in behavioral genetics. So that, that line of evidence is, is irrelevant. Um, for, so mm -hmm. it, with respect to the, the East Asians, I mean, there are huge structural, economic, uh, ecological differences, mm -hmm. uh, cultural differences between East Asian uh, countries and between East Asian countries and between African, Sub-Saharan African countries. And if you look, for example, at plasticity of IQ among East Asians, by, for example, looking at poor Japanese immigrants to the United States or third generation Chinese immigrants to the United States, you see tremendous plasticity in those means. So um, I, I don't quite understand those two lines of reply to the, the, the reverse causation argument. Yeah. For, uh, well, for one thing, I know of no, no evidence of the, plas of the massive plasticity of um, the IQs of Asian immigrants to the U.S. Uh, so I'm thinking of this study of, of uh, the, these discriminated Japanese groups who, were, who shot up 10 points within a generation in the U.S. So. Okay. Well, so, so suppose it were 10 points. Even still, that would be small by the standards of what I'm looking at. Um, 
I, I'm more familiar with things sort of in the sort of four to five point range. And more importantly, when we look across generations now, the, the modern literature has to take account of the Flynn effect, which is that the long-term rising trend in IQ. So I don't know if the particular things you're talking about are, are, are Flynn effect adjusted. Um, the, um, so, that's, that's not replied, it will help you, Yeah, the Flynn the appeal, effect appeal. is the opposite. No, the Flynn effect suggests that there's possibility for large environmental effects. Yeah, the Flynn effect is evidence for large environmental effects. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a huge fan of trying to tap into the Flynn effect. I wish economists had actually written an empirical paper by now on the Flynn effect. Um, it has yet to be done. So um, the, uh, the, the behavioral genetics research gives us evidence that across the normal range of variation, which is a very narrow one, right? That, those kinds of th uh, environmental effects have little effect on adult IQ. Um, when you say that there are social and cultural and structural and blah, blah, blah reasons, for differences across countries, I would say, yeah, that's what my research is about. My microstructure research shows that differences in intelligence create emergent different cultural outcomes. So you start with a group of people who are highly intelligent, and what do I know happens on average in experimental settings? They cooperate more. They're building a culture of cooperation. So it is just what I would just what would be predicted by my theory. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not getting your argument. So can you just walk me through why these things wouldn't vitiate the causal arrow that goes? The, what's the evidence for a causal arrow going from IQ to the entire gene? Oh, uh, what is the evidence for it? Yeah, I mean, there, so there's an alternative hypothesis that the IQ is going up because of better economic conditions, not the reverse, um, or or causation going both ways. I, I'm totally open to causation going both ways, right? Okay. So so if if someone wants to provide evidence. If someone would like to provide evidence at some point that there's evidence that there's causation going from GDP to IQ in a large systematic way, I, w I would love to see that. So I'm open to it. Um, but I think the way the evidence points right now is that there, my goal here is to point out that there is a causal arrow going from average what, IQ to good what cultures. That, what was that evidence? Um, I would say the experimental evidence from uh, this variety of, uh, variety of behavioral economic studies. Just quickly on that, I mean, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the correlations with IQ, they include, include things like urbanization, educational attainment, and liberalism. We have a whole bunch of other variables that could be driving cooperation there. Yes. So, so what I'm pointing out here is... Um,